guys, again, I am so sorry that I'm not here today to help you through this, but let's run through our going in circles practice to make sure we're on the right track. So number one wanted us to think about which word does not belong in the circle. Which one did you pick? Best option, glycerol. Why? Well, what does glycerol have to do with? Lipids, it's the backbone of that triglyceride. Whereas what do the other three terms all have in common? Good, they are carb words. We've got that energy in plants, the energy in animals, and the structural polysaccharide in animals. What about number two? Which word is missing from the circle? I want to warn you, the relationships actually go diagonally. So we know that starch is going to be the easy to break apart alpha linkage of glucose monomers. So who possesses that harder to break beta linkage? Yep, that is going to be the structural polysaccharide found in plants. And that's going to be our good buddy cellulose. Harder to break because it's structural, easier to break because it's energy. Next up, what do all of these terms have in common? All of these terms are related because they all have to do with lipids. So good job recognizing that. And now let's see, did you write an accurate and cohesive sentence? that uses all of these terms. You could have done this a number of ways. Here is just one possibility. I put my words together and I said that lipids are nonpolar or hydrophobic because they are made up of a glycerol bound to a hydrocarbon fatty acid chain via ester linkages. So these are the bonds that put them together. We've got that backbone with those three fatty acid chains, and remember those are primarily composed of H's and C's or hydrocarbons, making them nonpolar. Next up, ah, your neighbor's struggling. We need to explain to them what a steroid is and how to recognize it. Well, keep in mind a steroid is a lipid because it's nonpolar, because it doesn't get along with water. And we can recognize it because it's made up of those three hexagons and a pentagon, just like estrogen and testosterone. So these can make up steroidal hormones, and actually cholesterol is even an example of a steroid. Next, number five, how do carbs and lipids relate to dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis reactions? Well, keep in mind, these are both made of subunits that are joined and broken apart, by dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. Carbs have their special covalent bonds that result, and those are called glycosidic linkages, while lipids have their own special covalent bonds, and remember those are ester linkages. Good, they're formed and they're broken. Next up, we've got another someone doesn't fit in this circle. Who was your best choice? Who was our outlier? Good. Nucleic acids don't belong here because our other three words all relate to proteins. Proteins have monomers or subunits called amino acids that are joined together by peptide bonds. And a key part of the amino acid is the amino group, the carboxyl group, and the variable R group, or that side chain. Nucleic acids, on the other hand, are a completely different type of organic molecule. These are gonna be our genetic information, like DNA and RNA. Ooh, this feels like more protein talk. Who is missing from the circle? These are all descriptions of groups that hang off that alpha or that central carbon. There is an R group, a carboxyl, a hydrogen hanging off. So our best choice here is going to be 
the amino group. After all, that's what it takes to be an amino acid, is to have an amino group and a carboxylic acid. Here we've got another what do the terms have in common. As we look at these, we should be cluing into the fact that they do all relate because they are nucleic acid types of terms. So you, again, could link all of these words together in a number of ways. But here was my attempt. I said that nucleotides are made of a sugar, like deoxyribose, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base, like adenine, and along their backbone, they're attached by phosphodiester bonds. Not too bad a sentence, if I may say so myself. Number nine is thinking about that complex three-dimensional structure that we find in proteins. And we know that their primary structure is stabilized by peptide bonds. And here we can remind ourselves that their secondary structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. And their tertiary structure is stabilized by those R-group interactions. Keep in mind, if we keep multiple subunits together, when we join those, then we're looking at that quaternary structure. Whether we're looking at the primary structure and those peptide bonds, which then impacts the secondary, which impacts the tertiary and the quaternary, when we think about all these protein folds, we know that proteins work together. Things like enzymes, things like antibodies, different structural components. So the three-dimensional structure is key in proteins being able to interact with each other. And so this whole idea of structure determining function is going to be brought home because we've got this arrangement of the atoms, and that's going to determine if it has the alpha helices, the beta pleated sheet, those twists and turns, those accordion folds, and then even more complex three-dimensional structure and folding. That's why we even care about those four levels of structure. Finally, these key terms that will not go away, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis, how do they relate to proteins and nucleic acids? Well, again, they're still just describing how these organic molecules are built and broken. Remember that proteins have peptide bonds that are formed as a result of dehydration synthesis reactions? while nucleic acids have phosphodiester bonds, just fancy words for the covalent sharing of carrying bonds that result from dehydration synthesis reactions. These are also the bonds that are broken through hydrolysis reactions. Hopefully this helped to go over the main ideas of your going in circles activity.